Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for stopping by. Today I want to share with you a really, really good story. It may take you a few minutes to get into it, but trust me, it's well worth it. It's narrated by my good friend, Stories, Fables and Ghost Tales, and once you're done, please remember to go check out his channel because his quality content is top notch and I know that you'll enjoy it just as much as I do. But without further ado, let's get right in. Shit man, you hidden out of town or something? No. You sharing then? Your buddies better be lifting part of the cost. Nope, not sharing. Okay. You ain't skipping town and you ain't sharing. So what's the deal with you buying in bulk all of a sudden? Don't worry about it, Phil. He handed me the bag with the opus, but he kept his hand on it. You ain't trying to use this all at once, are you? I said don't worry about it. Look, man, I got like an obligation to make sure you ain't gonna try and do that. So make me a promise. You know this stuff. You know what it does. Yeah, it's the deadliest drug in the world, Phil. And you sell it for a living. Since when do you care about responsibility? I don't know, man. I just don't want to lose a good customer, is all. You know? That's $600. I handed him all the money I had left in the world. Not like it mattered. And then I took the bag and walked the three blocks past the bakery and the bent lamppost and up to my apartment. One last time. There was another eviction notice on the door. Not like it mattered. But rather than tearing it down, I pushed past it, threw the hall onto the old table by the chair, took out the baggie of opus, crushed the brick with a knife, and set up the rig. It's a bit like heroin in how you fix up a dose for a shot. You melt it, and then you tie off and stick the needle into whatever vein that was left to be found. And then you push it down, and then you watch the drug swirl with your blood for a bit, which is beautiful in its own sick way. And then you push it in. And that's where it differentiates from heroin. With heroin, you feel a rush of warmth, but with opus, you don't. You just feel cold, unnaturally so. So if you ever see a scrawny son of a bitch curled up and shivering on a park bench on a summer afternoon, you can bet with an appreciable degree of confidence that he's either got the shakes or he's gotten his hands on a bit of opus. And then after that passes, that's when you feel really, really good. Words can't describe it, to be thoroughly honest. Although euphoria is one of the words people like to pick off the low-hanging branch, all that can be said is that when it hits you, in all its force and all its momentum, and all its breathtaking might. You can't speak or move or even think. You just lay there and bathe in the majesty of it all, even as your organs scream, and then you pass out. It's a basal pleasure that needs to be experienced to be believed. But stay the hell away from it and all that blah blah blah. Not like it matters. It's what comes after the euphoria that counts anyway. So I did my business, and I felt the rush, and I felt the old euphoria. And then I felt the black clouds swirl in, and my vision tunneled. And soon I was floating away on a dead river, clinging to the last bit of flotsam adrift from a monumental shipwreck. And then I was gone. Hang on, Jess. I'm coming. You know what's a funny expression? Being beside yourself. I've always understood what it meant, of course. You're beside yourself when you're heartbroken, or you're traumatized, or you're angry beyond what words can articulate, and you haven't learned yet how to cope with spectacular pain. But until you're actually beside yourself, hearing the expression doesn't make sense, even if you don't ruminate on its implications. Is there supposed to be another one of me? who shares in pain that's too intense for either one of us to bear? Is that 
what it means to be beside yourself? I don't know. But I found out. It turns out, interestingly, that being beside yourself is what happens when your world comes crashing down. But you react not with rage or sorrow, but with numbness. And it's like you're watching yourself go through the motions of grieving, but you can't actually feel anything because of this emotional firewall that your brain in its finite wisdom erected. You're in shock, like it's someone else whose life was just turned upside down and not yours. An out-of-body experience, and you're just along for the ride. Nothing feels real. The police telling you she's gone? Fake. It has to be, and therefore it is. Phone calls flooding in? Loved ones saying how sorry they are for your loss? Lies. But you go through the motions anyway. And as you say thanks, yeah, I'm doing okay. No, I don't need anything. I don't know when the funeral is. I'll let you know. And all the affairs and the proceedings and the weeping and the disbelief that follow are just part of a weird, twisted dream. It's not real. It can't be. But deep down, of course, you know it's real. Deep down, you know there's an avalanche of pain and anguish and hurt. More of it all than the human spirit was ever built to catalog. That's waiting like a dragon on the other side of that firewall. And eventually, maybe on the first night you crawl into bed alone. Or when her favourite movie comes on and she's not there to share it with you. Or when you hear that old song, Firelight on the radio that played when you first kissed her. And you thought to yourself, how did a guy like me get a girl like her? That dragon will find its way in. And there's no going back from that. You're a new man now. And a lesser one than once you were. That's when you truly learn what it means to be beside yourself. When the real you and the you that was just going through the motions of grief collide into one gigantic, shattered, sobbing mess. You don't care what you look like when it happens. You don't care where you are. Or who's watching. Or what they'll think. And that's because you can't. One minute, you're doing okay, and the next all the power of your spirit and all the strength of your arms are being spent on weathering a storm that can't be weathered. Enduring the undurable, accepting the unacceptable. She's gone, and she's not coming back. For me, it happened at Jesse's funeral. Before that, I'd been a robot. But as soon as everyone left, even her parents, and I was the only one standing there on the grass, I lost it. The finality of it hit me like a storm of fists, and the firewall broke down. The dragon swept in, and I just collapsed at the headstone and cried until it hurt, and then I cried some more. My best friend, my partner in crime, my girl, gone, along with a piece of me. It's an impossible and surreal experience to describe. It's mutilating and it's unfair, and yet it is what it is. Life goes on without you, no matter how hard you scream at it. I'm hurting here! Give me a fucking second, will you? And you're sinking. And you're drowning. And you're throwing your arms out like a lifeline. And all bets are off. When that lifeline comes, if it ever does, you take it. It doesn't matter what it is. It's called Magnum Opus, Ronnie said, in the middle of a bar as if he was selling me car insurance and not a Schedule 1. Magnum Opus? Yeah, got me through my breakup with Ash. Stuff is fucking phenomenal. Mark, I swear to God. I should have noted his emaciated physique and his scraggly beard and his unemployment. And thought, well... It sure does look like you got through it in one piece, buddy. But I didn't. The logical part of me had been on hiatus for 29 days at that point. Yes, I counted. And I didn't know when it was coming back. If it ever was. What's it like? You get this cold rush when you inject it. Then you just feel fucking awesome. Can't even really describe it to you, bro. You just gotta try it. Sounds kind of like heroin, except for the cold rush. Nah, man. Heroin's great. Don't get me wrong, but it's just physical. 
opus was made for stuff like this. Stuff like what? Loss. I blinked. Yeah, some hallucinogenic property, or something or other. It's real attached to your emotions. So, if you're going through some shit, it plays on that and you get these, like, visions. Visions? Huh. Yeah, for me, I saw Ash every time I hit it, and it was all healing and stuff. And I know a guy who lost his dad, and when he took it, dude, he was like having catches and going to baseball games with his old man. I mean, it was all in his head, but it's so real you can't tell the difference. I should have said, not interested, thanks, and left right then and there. But I didn't. How much is it? It ain't cheap, bro. But I know a guy who slings it for fucking pennies on the dollar. Come on, I'll take you there. Phil is a weird looking son of a bitch, to say the least. I think he has maybe 12 teeth left, all yellow. And he weighs 120 pounds soaking wet, and he's covered ankle to jawline in tribal tattoos. Also, he's at least 50. He's balding on top and yet still sporting a Silver Street ponytail with a roadmap of wrinkles. And as far as I can tell, the dude lives in the alley he sells from, despite easily pulling in upper five figures doing the actual selling. Ronnie spoke up first. Yo, Phil, you got anything for me? Phil looked me over and took mental note of how out of place I was. No tattoos, no piercing, short haircut. And then said, Who's your friend? I ain't looking to get busted. Nah, Mark's cool, bro. Just lost his girl, so he's all like, in pain and stuff. Think you can hook him up? Sure man, newbie special. One bag for $125. More where that came from. I snorted. <clears throat> Shit. $125? Yeah man, I told you Phil could hook you up. That's a fucking steal. I wouldn't pay that much for a used phone, Ronnie. I'm not paying it for this shit. I turned around and started walking away. But then Ronnie said, You want to see Jess again, right? So I stopped. God damn it. I would pay $125 for that. I think I'd pay all the money in the world, in fact. I turned around. You promised me this will work, Phil? Yeah, it works, brother. Believe it. I'd be a fucking dead man if it didn't. Ronnie took me back to his place and got me a rig. A spoon and a syringe and a tourniquet and a lighter and then he cooked up a shot and tied me off. I was fresh meat and my heart was pounding so finding a vein to hit was as easy as it ever be. It's ready? Just like that? Just like that man? And it's all melted and everything? Will you just trust me, bro? I got you. Been doing this for a year now. Make a fist. Okay, okay. Just nervous is all. Make a fist, I said. Good. He found the vein and cleaned the spot with a swab. What will it feel like? Guess you're about to find out, ain't you? I didn't get a chance to respond before he stuck the needle in, and then the rush hit me in a tidal wave. Frigid cold at first, and then a euphoric sensation the likes of which, like I said above, cannot adequately be described. I said and thought and knew nothing more. I just curled up into a ball and rode the wave right into the emptiness. Firelight's on again, Marky. You know I hate it when you call me that. That's why I do it. To get a rise out of you, Marky. I punched Jess lightly on the arm. Hey, you're going to knock me off the hood. Better stop calling me Marky, then. Big Red or else you'll fall right off the cliffside. Scrawny little bitch like you? I'm pretty sure I could take you down. Oh yeah? Hundred bucks as I pin you in a minute flat. She didn't even say, You're on. She just pounced on me and grappled my wrists and tried to put me in a hold. It was adorably ineffective. I wriggled out with ease and got her by the waist and crawled on top of her. Say, uncle, aunt. Alright, you asked for it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Crippler. I made fake cheering noises and patted my elbow and pretended to bring it down on her chest. Ha <laughs> The Crippler. That's the wrestler's name you came up with? You're just jealous I thought of it first. Crippler is the shit and you know it. 
All I know is you probably kiss like a girl, Mr. Crippler. I leaned down and took the bet, and I kissed her. It only lasts a second, but your first kiss sticks with you the longest, after all. And when I pulled back, we just stared at each other. Her up at me in front of the whole night sky, with a band of the Milky Way reaching across it, and the cliff sides hit back by starlight, and my back down at her, lying there on the banged up, red rusted hood of my car. I had the better view by far, and I thought, how did a guy like me get a girl like her? I woke up on Ronnie's hardwood floor the next morning, amidst an ocean of empty bottles and pizza boxes, and vomit. It took me a second to piece back where I was, and all that had happened, and it utterly broke my heart when I remembered it wasn't more than a narcotic dream. But what a dream it was, so in spite of the heartache, and the headache, and the dizziness and the thirst, I crawled over to Ronnie and shook him awake and said, Holy shit, man. Get me more of that stuff now. Uh, for what? The opus. The opus, man. I need more of it. Uh, you know where Phil is. His head fell back to the floor, and he dozed off again. He was right, though. I knew exactly where Phil was. And after I called in sick to work, I headed straight down to his alley, aching and groaning the whole time and telling my own broken heart, she's real enough, she's back, in the dream. Just need another dose to get to her. I got to the alley 15 minutes later. I don't think Phil had moved an inch. Back for more? Yeah. That stuff was incredible, man. Give me another bag. I handed him 125 fresh from the ATM on 7th. But instead of taking it, he scoffed. <laughs> like I said, brother, 125 a bag is the newbie special. Returnin' customers ain't eligible for that discount. 200. 200 dollars? For a bag? Are you fucking crazy? Nope. And it don't matter how mad you are either. You'll buy it anyway. Just you watch. This shit don't let go easy. He was right, damn it. Of course he was right. I sighed and shook my head. <sighs> but I gave him the cash, and I don't think there was even a fleeting second where I wasn't going to. There were very few things I wouldn't do, in fact, for another trip back into that dream. So I got the little baggie and went the three blocks back to my apartment this time, past the bakery and the bent lamppost, and when I got inside, I cooked up the shot. I was in love all over again and it was every bit as wonderful and every bit as terrible as love is supposed to be. So, why do you love these old movies, again? Because they're classics, Mark, Jesse said. Show some respect when Jack Lemon is on screen, will you? At least for me? Okay, okay. It's not like I don't appreciate the stuff. It's just not for me, is all. How do you appreciate something that's not for you? That doesn't even make sense. Sure it does. I respect it. I admire it for its influence, and all that. <sighs> people say that all the time, and it's bullshit. Do you know what influence means? It means people looked at something and they said, Hey, that's new and weird and beautiful. I think I'll try that next. Nothing sets out to be that way. It just sets out to be the best version of itself. And every once in a while, its best is enough to break down walls and barriers. Sometimes completely by accident and everyone else will try to get even a small piece of it so they can be great, too. But, there's only ever one original. So all those movies you like, and all those TV shows and all the music, it can all be traced back to one moment in one person's head where a little bit of colour first stood out amongst all the dull grey, and they said, Hey, that's new and weird and beautiful. I think I'll see where it goes. Oh my god. Okay. We'll watch your stupid, new and weird and beautiful Jack Lemon movie. So I win? You win. She reached up and gave me a peck and said for the first time, I love you. And all of a sudden, I was willing to watch whatever stupid, new and weird and beautiful movie she wanted. I woke up in my bed. And when the reality hit back, it was just a dream? Fuck. My heart broke all over again and she felt further away than ever, as she always did. 
It had been seven weeks of this, and every morning after when I woke up and I realized that the adventure the night before was all in my head, it ripped me a fresh wound right in the heart of my spirit. Every day was like finding out she was gone all over again. But the solution to it all was, of course, another hit, another dose, another $400 a day. That bastard, tolerance, necessitated a doubling down of the dose for the same effect. Anything and everything that I could do to spend as much time in my fantasy world as possible, I would do. And I would do it gladly and willingly. So I paid what I had to. I hadn't been to work at all since Ronnie took me to Phil that night. And since then, my savings had flown the coop, and my credit card had maxed. And I'd ignored a combined 61 missed calls from worried sick friends and family. And yes, I counted. But I didn't care about any of it. All I cared about was my Jesse, and our brief but precious moments together in a world that wasn't real, but in which everything was okay. If only for a bit. I told myself over and over until I truly believed it, that pain and suffering and poverty in one world was more than an acceptable enough price to pay for true joy in another one. So on and on I went. The sound of a rap on the door gave me a splitting headache, but I got up and opened it anyway, and let the blinding sunlight hit me on my flat for the first time in days. The man on the other side, a mid-twenty-something from the looks of it, gasped audibly when he saw my emaciated physique and my scraggly beard and my obvious unemployment, as evidenced by the eviction notice on the door and the tracks on my arms. So I spoke first. Ugh, yeah? Hey, um, I, uh, I saw the ad online about the flat screen. That still for sale? Yeah, it's here. 300. Would you, uh, take 200? I'll take three. If I was willing to haggle, I would have put OBO in the ad. Take it or leave it. I desperately hoped he'd take it and go. I needed the cash, but I needed 300, not two, since... I'd only gotten a hundred when I pawned the phone. Okay, okay, I'll take it. He handed me a wad of bills and I helped him carry it to his car. When he peeled off, I didn't even head back upstairs. I just pocketed the money and went straight past the bent lamppost and the bakery and down to you know where to get my next hit. My head was spinning, but I didn't feel a damn thing. I just felt empty and confused. And it was dark in my room too. And hot. Dark and hot. Rarely a good combination. Jesse was nowhere to be found either. But then again, that was the whole point. Wasn't it? Fuck. I collapsed right down on the bed. A queen size with a dip on the left that wouldn't ever be filled up again. Unless I rolled into it in my sleep. Expecting to get stopped by Jesse. But I didn't sleep. Not tonight. I stayed up and tried to reconcile the fact that those officers were wrong ten minutes ago that my girl wasn't dead with the fact that Jesse was now three hours late coming home. They told me why, but they were wrong. They had to be. My girl isn't dead. She isn't. She couldn't be. And therefore, she isn't. She was late getting home. She'd be here, right? Any second now, she'd walk through that door and everything would be okay. Everything would go back to normal. And I'd be waiting for her, right here on the bed. It's gonna be okay. She's gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. The door indeed opened a few minutes later. But instead, Jesse was there, swirled in the darkness of the hallway. In an instant, my heart rose and fell. And then the old familiar chill set in. There were a pair of eyes in there too. Red ones. Scowling ones. Ones I recognized. Ones that visited me all too often and that got a little closer each time. I pulled the covers up over me and shut my eyes and tried to ignore the voices. But they didn't carry over distance and they weren't constrained by a quilt. You haven't called, said my mother right into my ear. Why haven't you called? Your father and I are worried sick. Look at you, Dad said. 
Pathetic, jobless, emaciated, unkept, penniless, futureless. You sold or abandoned everything of value. You should be fucking ashamed of yourself. Why can't you be more like your brother? He'd never do that to your mother and I. Ronnie then said, Dude, you're losing yourself to this drug. You gotta be careful when you hit the needle. I don't care what it is, but you're not being careful. Not even I got down as deep as you. I shuddered and cried, and begged and prayed for it to stop, for it to go away. But of course it couldn't. Not yet. Because that's when Jessie showed up. Three hours late, like she always was. And when I heard her voice, I burst into fresh tears, and shuddered and squeezed my eyes shut so hard, I thought they'd bleed. Look what you're becoming, Mark. I fell in love with a man with ambition, intelligence, humor. He loved life, but he died tonight, too. I threw the covers off and screamed into the darkness. Fuck you! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! But the voice didn't stop. And soon, the dragon stepped into my room. A step of confidence, then one of boldness, hot and snarling and stood at the front of my bed and said, in Jesse's voice, Him I loved, Mark, but I don't love you. This is your fault. You could have saved me. This is your fault. This is your fault. This is your fault. This is your fault. This is... I bolted upright. It was morning, of course, and spread around me were liquor bottles and the rig. Of course it was another dream, just a vision. It wasn't real. Dragons aren't real, either. But words are, regardless of where you hear them. You should be fucking ashamed of yourself. Why can't you be more like your brother? Him I loved, Mark. But I don't love you. I don't love you. The words played on a loop in my head. I took a swig, but they only got louder. I grabbed the bagger to see if even a little more of Opus was in there, that I could at least snort it if not shoot. But it's gone. Of course it's gone. Why wouldn't it be gone? I was good at one thing, and one thing only, and that was getting every last molecule of this venom in my veins, where it belonged. Why would I leave anything behind? I don't love you. I curled up again into a ball and cried a bit. Futureless! 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 They were right. I don't love you. Nobody did. I'd ruined everything. I'd burned every bridge. Fuck! I'd sold every bridge and etched them into the tracks on my forearm. That's what I'd done. Fuck me! Fuck. Me. Futureless. I know. I don't love you. I know. I don't either. I never did. I guess I knew that, too. Pathetic. I stood up. Everything hurt. Everything ached. My head swam. My lips were so dry they cracked and bled. Not like it mattered. I looked down at the needle. You're never gonna win, Mark. I've got you. Palm of my hand. I know. You're a dead man, Mark. I know. Do it. I know what you're thinking. Do it. Today. Just get it done. Do one right thing. Just one, if you can manage it. I will. I grab my jacket. Shit, man. You hidden out of town or something? No. You sharing then? Your buddies better be lifting part of the cost. Nope. Not sharing. Okay. You ain't skipping town and you ain't sharing. So what's the deal with you buying in bulk all of a sudden? Don't worry about it, Phil. He handed me the bag with the opus, but he kept his hand on it. You ain't trying to use this all at once, are you? I said don't worry about it. Look, man, I got like an obligation to make sure you ain't gonna try and do that. So make me a promise. You know this stuff. You know what it does. Yeah, 
is the deadliest drug in the world, Phil. And you sell it for a living. Since when do you care about responsibility? I don't know, man. I just don't want to lose a good customer, is all. You know? That's $600. I went home and pushed past the eviction notice and threw the baggie on the old table by the chair. Then I cooked up my shot, a massive, lethal motherfucker of a dose, and I tied off, and I found a vein after a good few minutes of hide and seek, and I stopped. Am I really doing this? I am. I was. So I did. I pushed the needle in and watched my blood swirl with it before being consumed by the blackness, and then I pushed it down, freezing aching cold, a rush of quantified atomized pleasure, and then the black cloud swelled in, and my vision tunneled, and soon I was floating away on a dead river, clinging to the last bit of flotsam adrift from a monumental shipwreck, and then I was gone. Hang on, Jess. I'm coming. Hey. Hey. Funny seeing you here so soon. I blinked. I didn't remember this conversation. Well, it hasn't happened before. Huh. Big enough dose will do that, I guess. Yeah, you can say that again. She looked around the swirling, endless clouds in which she stood, as if she too were new to this place. And then she looked back at me and said, What are you doing here, Mark? I don't know where here is, Jess, so how can I possibly answer that? I think you do. Maybe I did. So, I'll ask again. What are you doing here? What led you here? You did. I did? You want to explain that one to me? I don't know. You were gone, so I followed you here, like I always do. You didn't always do that. You had a life of your own once, Mark. It was good. It was rich. You had a future. Why are you here? I wanted to see you again. Is that such a crime? Well, here I am. Was it worth it? It's always worth it. Not even you believe that. She walked up a bit closer and looked at me with those big, ocean blue eyes that made my knees buckle, even now. And she took my hand in hers and held it. It felt real. It felt warm. I wasn't used to that. Warmth. So I pulled back a bit. But she tightened her grip and then rolled my sleeve up to the elbow, exposing my forearm and all the cuts on it, and all the bruises, and all the tracks. Fuck. She stared at the mess for a second. I didn't want you to find out about that, Jess. Well, it's a little late for that. This isn't you, Mark. Why didn't you just say no? Because I didn't, okay? It was offered to me, and I was still reeling from losing you, and I made an impulse decision. But this stuff is different. It's not just a physical high, Jess. It brought you back. It brought back everything I loved about you. One hit, and fuck, we were right back on the road again, with the windows down and the music blasting and the sunset coming up over the hilltops. And we didn't know where we were going, and we didn't care. As long as we were going there together, for a few hours every day, everything was okay again. How could I say no to that? It brought me back, did it? Yes. Did it bring back the first fight? What? Our first fight. Remember that one? Do you remember me throwing your econ textbook at the fridge and knocking down the magnets with a little dog on it? Or you just storming out? While I sat on the couch and cried, did it bring that back? No, I don't think it did. Maybe. Did it bring back the time you hinted that you didn't like my new haircut and how I gave you the cold shoulder for like three days straight? No. Did it bring back the time we had that stupid fucking fight about Jack Lemon? Yes, it did. And it wasn't a fight. That was the day you said you loved me, Jess. I remember, and I was so happy you said it, that I allowed us to watch the movie even though I wanted to watch Mulholland. You said it first. What? I love you. 
You said that first, not me. At the bakery by your apartment. You said it. And I was so nervous that I didn't say it back until the next day. I texted it to you. I said, hey, I love you too. And you wrote out this little novel about how scared you were that you'd said it too soon. And that you almost wanted to take it back so you wouldn't scare me away. Remember? Yeah. And we watched Mulholland that night. Shit. She was right. We did. Yeah, we did. Didn't we? Yep. But your little drug didn't bring that up. I guess not. Did it bring back, say, my loud chewing? You always made a point to mention it. I never had a meal after that without being self-conscious about how loud I chewed. Did it bring that back from the dead too? No. Or how fidgety I was. I could never get comfortable. Remember? Jesse, go to sleep. Stop moving so much. If I had a fucking nickel. What's your point? My point? Mark, I'm a human. A fully fleshed out, actual person. Not just an idea. Me, with all my flaws and all my imperfections and my quirks and hopes and dreams. You want me to believe a fucking drug fleshed me out like that? It's a drug, Mark. It's not magic. Well, whatever it did, it was enough. Well, it shouldn't have been. Don't you get it? You shouldn't be able to just bring someone back like that. I'm more than memories, Mark. You, of all people, should know the difference between loving me and loving the idea of me. I mean, fuck. What does it say about me? About us? That you could just conjure up one good rose-tinted memory and be satisfied? You said yourself it brought back everything I loved about you. Not everything. It didn't. I said it brought you back. You said both. And then we found out it didn't even do that right. Don't do that, Jess. Do what? That. Don't you fucking dare insult me by implying that I didn't love you the right way. I'm a sick wrecked bastard but if there's one thing i did right in all the time i knew you it was love you so much that it spilled over and i loved everything and everyone else more because of it and when you died when you died jesse i destroyed myself just to catch a fleeting glimpse of a shade of you and i didn't run away from the pain i owed it to you to stay to learn that pain inside and out to let it roll over me in waves and fucking ruin me as a man until I couldn't recognize myself anymore. I owed you that much. And if that's not love, then I don't know what is. We sat down on the edge of a cloud and looked out over infinity together. She put her head on my shoulder and then said, I loved you too. You loved me? Yeah, I loved the man you were. The man I was? I'm the one who's still here. No, you're not. This isn't you, Mark. It's not. And you know that. I think a part of you died that night, with me, out there on the road. I looked at the tracks on my arm. She was right. I hated it when she was right. I know you hate it when I'm right, but I'm right. All the same, aren't I? Do you recognize yourself? No. Do you recognize your own thoughts anymore? You're a dead man, Mark. Palm of my hand. No. Do you think that's what I wanted for you when I was gone? No. Is it what you wanted from me? To be tortured over your death? To think, fuck, if I'd only done this or that, I could have saved him? No. She took my hand, for real this time. I felt life again. It had been so long since I'd felt alive. How did you do that? Do what? That. After everything I did, it was you who brought me back to life. How did you do that? I don't know. It only ever worked with you. And that says something, doesn't it? Maybe. Maybe it means I'm still down there somewhere. I hope so, Mark, because I haven't fallen out of love either. Really? Really? We sat there for a while before she said, Can you do something for me, Mark? I'd do anything for you. You know that. K. 
Can you let me go? I thought you said... I did. That's why I'm asking this of you. There might not be a happily ever after for us, Mark, but there's still one out there for you. And as your best friend, as your partner in crime, as your girl, I want more than anything for you to find it. I... I don't know if I can. Do it for me. She leaned in and kissed me. And it seemed like all the clouds and all the stars were falling into line. One last time. I felt a rush. I felt a heartbeat. And then I was gone. Hey, hey, we got a pulse! <gasps> I bolted upright and gasped so loud the EMT stumbled back. <sighs> Welcome back to life, Mr. King, one of them said. You overdosed on Opus. Uh, how long was I out? Out? You were dead. Blue in the face. No pulse. Dead. <sighs> For at least 15 minutes. You're lucky your buddy Phil gave us a call to check up on you. I fell back to the bed. I felt terrible. A headache. Iron taste in the mouth. Parched. And bleeding. But I was alive for the first time in as long as I could remember. I signed the paperwork and checked out of the hospital when I could. And I took the long way home. I had no car. I had no money. No job. No savings. Nothing. And when I got back to my apartment, it was an absolute wreck. An empty one, too. Everything was gone. The furniture, the bed, the TV, all sold or pawn for drug money. But I was alive. I had a future. And maybe, just maybe, Jesse was right. Maybe there was a happily ever after waiting for me out there, somewhere after all. And all I needed was to run up and seize it. The idea was new and weird and beautiful, and I thought, you know, I think I'll see where that goes. And I threw the needle in the trash.